Uh, all right, we're going. All right. All right. Kendall Street Company is an alt jam rock band based out of Charlottesville, Virginia. They have a unique instrumentation of electric guitar, acoustic guitar, sax, keys, bass, and drums. And they move seamlessly from acoustic singer songwriter numbers to steely Dan S. Funk before hitting a psychedelic jam or landing in a West Coast groove. We are so lucky to have them here today. They have a quite a few new releases out over the past few years, which we'll get into. And uh, why don't we say hi? I have Jake and Lewis here. How you doing today, guys? Doing great and really well. Thanks for hey. having us. Yeah, thank you. Also, you nailed it. Hey, thank you. <laughs> you nailed it. On, nailed it on the description. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> trying i'm trying i'm working on it I've, I've i've been reading cream magazine and rolling stone since i was eight so <laughs> i've got it in my head there all right let's yeah. take it from the top the question that jumped out at me first is what's up with the goat in the say hey video uh-huh. uh well th- we were at the studio uh called white star sound white star studio in louisa virginia which is kind of between richmond and charlottesville and there's also an active goat farm as well as being a music studio. So there were what, three, there's three or four goats there. Yeah, I think three goats. And they just, they're just like hanging out outside the studio. So whenever we step out for a breath of fresh air, we just we hang out with the goats a little bit. Nice, nice. They're a little fun and demonic too. I, I like the way they, you know, the little tiny horns. Yeah. They don't have big horns. They don't make a little mouth. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's so and their cool. eyes are crazy. Um, and you were at the studio recording which album? We've done a number of albums at that studio. Um, in the Say Hey video, we were recording uh, The Year the Earth Stood Still. Um, I guess but we recorded both parts, the Nerda and Inertia. Uh, during that session oh, oh so so they uh, they were i was going to ask this later but let's jump into that it's two albums for the people who don't know and you release them two separate dates right the all instrumental was uh, one date and the one with the vocals was another date but you did record mm-hmm. them all in one shot yeah okay and we didn't we didn't know where they were going to be broken up until after the fact so we recorded them you know, without any bias towards it. And then later on, we di- made the division where we felt was necessary. And we cut we cut a few things too. There were, there were some ideas that were recorded that didn't get implemented in any way yet. So, <laughs> right. yeah. And nothing was, nothing was written before we went into the studio. We went in and this was like in, you know, uh, June, July of 20... 2020. 2020. Yeah, it was in the middle of the summer, yeah. Yeah, and so we we were just, you know, ready to to get in the studio and record, and but we went in going, all right, we're gonna, um, you know, we're gonna go in and just and just play and just see what we come up with, and we ended up, you know, writing two records, uh, which was crazy. And recording, pretty much, right? And recording. Right. I, I saw that um, you had listed uh, your bass player, Brian, did all the lyrics for the one album with the lyrics. Is that correct? Uh, not all of them. He did um, Home and Garden. And then, yeah, if we pull up the track listing, I could tell you. Brian did Home and Garden. He did the stuff he sang on. Yeah, um, when Brian sings, he typically writes the lyrics. Generally, when somebody sings in our band, they write the lyrics, but not not always. I sometimes sing some of some of Ben. Ben plays the electric electric guitar, and he writes songs, and I'll, I'll sing some of his songs sometimes. Nice, nice. So, um, yeah. is there a story? If you, I saw it listed as a space opera. So, is there a loose story that you want to tell us about, or is it one of these? You listen to it and you make your own story. Let's pull up the, we're pulling up the track listing right now. That'll help us tell the story a little bit. Okay. You know, it, you it, it's, fascinating. Yeah. it's fascinating <laughs> to me when we, you, several people, different voices come together to tell a story. Um, I do this thing called what yeah. and we kind of do that. There's four of us and we all have our own thing and try to make it a whole. So that's fascinating as opposed to like a, a Pete Townsend who writes everything. It's his vision, you know, right. it's thematically through the whole thing. Well, I mean, this this record is very much a collaboration between all of us. You know, we all 
sat there and wrote it together. We, we didn't have a story in mind necessarily when we wrote it, uh, but that kind of came together as we were putting the pieces together. It all kind of came together like this convoluted puzzle that, you know, you had to shape the pieces. Right. And then, right. But so Ninerta is um, the first track on Ninerta, the title track. Uh, and that comes from Ninurta is an ancient Sumerian god of what thunder and war and um, some other. Some I think other wild he, stuff. he slayed he slayed a seven headed right. serpent. I think right. Nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's where the the seven comes. So in. that's where the seven comes from, which is an important the odd the odd factor is an important important part of the the double album. Uh, just a theme that goes through it. So the song is in seven four. And that kind of inspired the search for something okay. seven related. Yeah. And then there was also a giant thunderstorm uh -huh. that knocked out the power to the recording computer one night. Yeah. While we were chanting. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were chanting oh, like. Wow, 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 wow. So you hear that at the end of the record. <laughs> and the power, the big thunderstorm knocked the power out. And we were worried that we had lost some of the sessions. But it, it ended up all getting recorded and saved. Nice. And, um. And yeah, so that's where that comes from. And then Brian... So click save all. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And then Brian did some Googling, I think, and found 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 the story of Ninurta. And it just felt like it fit really well. And we let it inspire you know, whatever. We had like one day left, two days left or something like that. At yeah. that point, we had a little bit of time left. Yeah. So we kind of like had a premise going forward into the final days, of which there were only like six. So final days. Yeah. <laughs> is it tougher to walk into the studio with nothing and say, all right, we got, you know, five days total. We're going to be here. We have to come up with something or is it easier? Do you find to walk in with a book full of songs already? Uh, it depends. Definitely. Like if you're going in and you have a song written, that's, that's like very technical, that can be hard to nail, you know, and sometimes, having that pressure of like knowing you have to nail this um, is, can be, you know, can be difficult. There's something like really special and inspiring about going in with nothing written that, you know, you're not really sure what you're going to get. You don't know if it's going to be good. Um, and, but there's, but there's something like a weight lifted because of that. Like I, I feel kind of the opposite of what you were saying where you go, Oh, we have to write something. It's almost just like, we're going to write something. We're going to write something. I know that, you know? Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's really fun to do that, but it, you can hit writer's block or things like that. Sometimes that, that make the process a little more. I found it interesting. Your album before was called the stories we write for ourselves, which is much more singer songwriter song oriented than the thing you did which fascinates me. I, I love that you guys have the two sides. What what were the differences in, in the approach and the recording of those two separate projects? I wanted to go back to the story of the Ninerta real quick. Oh, sure, sure. Just, Definitely. Yeah, there's like some... So looking at the track listing, we described like Ninerta and how we got the basic premise there. But then the next couple songs, Our Space Heroine and Picking Apples Off the Apple Street was kind of like a vague like female main character driving through space theme kind of um surrealist the, the, even the apple tree huh yeah kind religious. of like uh, well not religious but like Re religious as, imagery how about religious imagery there yeah we can take that yeah, yeah. um and which is good stuff you, you put something like job or eve somewhere they're going to do what they're supposed to do for your song or your story <laughs> <laughs> the, the people will understand the people will understand <laughs> yeah yeah good point and that's a flashback too like in the story of our the space heroine, like imagine uh, during track two, is driving through space, um, like chilling, like one. Yeah. yeah, and then but there's some angst or something. There's a flashback to some simpler times. Um, that's and that goes into track three. All right, and then and then what is what is uh do what is the uh what moves the story forward then with the next songs. Well, the apple tree is kind of like the car coming to a stop. And, and that's where Lewis is talking about the nostalgia factor right. of like leaving Earth behind 
and in the story of the year the earth is still you you kind of leave earth a little bit uh and eventually you come back at the end of inertia with underneath the summer sun where you're just like sitting in the pool and it's all just been a little bit of a dream you come back to yourself um so this is kind of where you take off uh and it's just like a child it's supposed to evoke feelings of childhood nostalgia um in the grand scheme of things especially with the space race coming next like kind of this robotic angsty call to action like uh movement to arms an aggression right like level in which is a nice contrast to the previous instrumental it also that in particular is one that just happened improvised we were recording our space heroine as a take and we just went into that and we decided to make it a second track so that was a more so random creation found music yeah. yeah, and the space race was was only was one of the few ones that we had that was planned when we went in the studio. We had the we had the basic guitar idea, and the idea that we wanted to maybe have, use some samples, and and that's what occurred. Yeah, and Ben went and found that JFK speech after the fact and just dropped it in there. And I think right where he dropped it the first time is where we left it. It was perfect. Yeah. So as far as like thematic anchors, that was the only anchor we had on the Nerda. And so we knew there was we were gonna have to deal with space because we we had this idea to call it the space race, you know. So um, that was the only anchor we had for that one. And then on inertia, we had one song planned as well, but that was it. Uh, I hope that like told the the actual like story, like why we ordered them a little bit better. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely. There's the pink flying saucer theme which is like aliens coming to visit you. And sometimes you wish you could be taken away and then they come for you, but they leave you behind in the Nerda. And then they come back at the end of inertia. And this time they take you with them. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. That's left. literally what we were talking about. <laughs> it sounds crazy. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it. You got to have that. Uh, I was going to ask you guys, how important do you think, building a mythology is for a band in building a fan base like the grateful dead did you know they used the mid the western thing the gambler that was their mythology and then fish created the whole thing with game Eng and lots of other bands you know i remember this band grinch years and years ago did an album called wilbur and it was basically retelling game Eng. you know but they were trying to do something to build community do you think having a mythology something like this double album helps to bring people in and keep them yeah absolutely i mean it's not something that i had thought about as like a mythology of the band i guess because we're literally like existing in it it's our lives and i guess it, it feels like it becomes mythology like once you you know over time and when people really catch on but i i do feel like we have some characters that are that come about in the music like there's this character called Josefina and she's on a couple of uh in in space for days and she comes back a bit and in stories did she come back in stories yeah i think she's the yeah. character from lady i love <laughs> yeah to bring to bring it back to the stories right yeah. for ourselves that's that's kind of on a parallel existence i kind of see it as like there's the year there's so they're kind of existing in parallel the, the ideas of the records and sometimes they intertwine um, or cross paths, but yeah, each album kind of is its own universe. Yeah. Maybe. Well, not its own universe. It, well, maybe its own universe in a multiverse theory. <laughs> there you go. And then there's other characters like uh, Shanti, the dolphin. Yeah. Like we did the nautical aquatical. And so those are, those are kind of things that I think people really connect to, you know, people love to hear about Shanti and they, they love to hear stories about, that's the thing that ends up on a lot shirt when you get big enough. Those kind of songs. Right. That's, you know, kind of the thing I'm getting with. It, it, it's what built yeah. it. Because then someone else, I see you at the grocery store and I'm like, I knew that. I knew that band. I knew that song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I, I do think that's important is like giving the audience something to connect to that is like adjacent to the band that is not necessarily, like only people who are on the on the inside would know. Right. Right. We've got this character called Lenny the Lemon. Lenny the Lemon. Okay, what's that? Lenny story? the Lemon. Yeah, who like only comes out at festivals, so, oh. <laughs> and he like it's a festival lemon. We and we go out in the audience and toss the lemon, 
And people so take bites of the lemon. People too. take bites out of the lemon, and Which, so woo, damn, yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of a new character in our. We think he's going to be on the terrestrial equestrial, which is a follow up to the nautical aquatical about land animals. Oh, nice, nice, yeah. very nice. So since then, since you did the space opera, though, you did another album which I found fascinating called Untitled California Project. And it seems like it came yeah, from like yeah. a Carl Denson Gray Boy vibe in California Wanda. You know, California Seventeen is like straight ahead country rock ditty kind of thing. I love yeah. it. I love that thing. I just... <laughs> we could we could spend hours talking oh. about California Project. Oh, it's so weird. Yeah, <laughs> it's a weird project. Yeah, but it was pretty fun. So, so the background of that project is that. My, I have cousins that live in Ohio and they have a lake and we stayed in, in their house one time and our guitar player, Ben, was like fascinated with their with their story and with their existence. Their way of life. And the, and the fact that they had moved to California, some of them, including one of them named Mark. And, uh, and then we were talking with Mark, who works in LA and like sound editing, uh, about doing a TV show together, potentially or like a web series show. So we wrote like 20 to 30 little like sound bites for this like car- cartoonish uh, like comedy info show thing. And then some of those like little snippets turned into actual songs. And th- they tell the story of the journey of uh, Mark from Ohio to, nice. to LA. I love that kind of that way of doing things there. There's a band out in new Orleans called the radiators. And one time they wrote a fake set list and went out and played the fake set list and love just it. made it. That's up funny. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then, we, and then we did that trip. Yeah. So we went to California is the other part of that story. Then that's why we released it this past summer. Cause we went to California for the first time Yeah. Uh, to play high Sierra and a couple other cities. Ooh, um, high Sierra. That's like the, yeah. the mother jewel of California festivals there. It yeah. was great. We had two sets. We had a late night set and a, like an afternoon evening set, which was yeah. really nice. And we've got both cool. of those sets uh, multi-tracked and recorded and mixed. So they'll be coming out on Nugs. Yeah. Nugs. Nugs. Nugs yeah. right. so, so in our guys, website. Too, yeah. How'd you guys end up with Nugs? Is that just your management getting you in or do they approach you? Well, we've just, we've wanted to be on there for a while and haven't been able to like consistently record audio that we were happy with of mm-hmm. our live shows. Uh, okay, you know? okay. Uh, and then last year we got an in-ear monitor rack. We built one uh, that can also multi-track record. So for this entire year, we've been able to multi-track oh, nice. and launched with like, 20 ish shows at once, but it took us a while to get the workflow right. Um, right. We, you know, honestly, we're still working on it a little bit, but but it was just like finding the right method to make it sound as good as we want it to be. Sound. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you with that. I, I for many years, was uh, a taper, mics and soundboards, yeah. whatever. I much like the, I, I always like the soundboard, but. It kind of sounds like a photographic negative sometimes. I think matrix mixes are the best because you can clean mm. up, you know, the bottom, but you still feel the room. Yeah, feeling the room is important. We have uh, crowd mics that face the audience that we put up, um, and also like through a lot of the vocals, we all have vocal mics, so you capture a lot of air, which is nice. Nice. I like it. I like it. I'll have to uh, keep my eye open. The next time you guys come through Baltimore, DC, I'm definitely going to come down and check you out there um, are you are you familiar with the ramble fest mm, no i do not know that yeah check that out that's coming up uh, this weekend we'll yeah. be there on friday it's i think it's right around baltimore okay cool um, i'll have to look into that yeah the ramble it's a it's this will be its first year brand first new year. festival mm-hmm I it totally did not catch my radar. The, I I went out for the first time to a club in Baltimore Saturday night in since before quarantine to see pigeons Flocktoberfest. Wow, and uh, that was fun. The band that opened with open for him, Yam Yam. You ever heard of them? They were pretty fun. They had a sax guy too. Yeah, heard, heard of them? You yeah. should have yeah, a festival with all sax people. 
that would be, be fun, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Saxapalooza. I, I wanted to ask you about two big names that I think of when I think of Charlottesville, Virginia, or Hornsby and Dave Matthews, obviously. And you guys kind wow. of have, are one of the few bands that have a similar in, instrumentation to Dave Matthews in as much as the acoustic guitar and the saxophone. Were either of those guys influences on you or is it just happenstance that you're in the same area that they are? Well, yeah, they were, uh, Dave Matthews was a big influence on, on me. Um, like, yeah, I listened to a lot of Dave Matthews in high school, went to big phase and, uh, partly the reason I went to college at UVA was to start playing music in Charlottesville. Um, and so, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's cool to be in the same city and do it and doing it. But I feel like we've, we've definitely grown as a band, you know, people used to make the comparison a lot. I, I don't hear that at all really with you. Yeah. Not so much anymore. Just, uh, you got to start somewhere, you know, I mean, Nirvana yeah. was ripping off, you know, the Pixies and shit like that. Uh, you no, know, I mean it's that, that's how you learn. You got to crawl first. You know, um, T. S. Eliot once said that uh, good poets imitate and great poets steal. So do that nice. with your will. I have to use that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when someone says, "Hey, you stole that from me," <laughs> um, so, You're so related <laughs> related to that, I, I know a lot of bands that are jam bands one don't like being called that and two didn't really listen to jam bands growing up what's the, what's the case with you were you fans of jam the scene like fish fans beforehand or were you musicians who fell into this scene it's really it's really different for every single member of the band um we all had different musical backgrounds so like our drummer was on the drum line and in marching band and like was aware of the jam scene certainly yeah growing up um, well, he was really into Dave Matthews band too, the drummer. Yeah. Uh and big fan of Carter Beaufort. Yeah, so there's heavy yeah. inspiration there. And then our bass player uh grew up playing classical bass, classical upright bass, and for a long time played upright in the beginning of the band and then switched to electric. Um Interesting. and he has like a hybrid electric tooth sometimes that he plays or records. Um right. so he had like exposure there. And I grew up playing saxophone in the school band and like a jazz band and played in some combos. And so that's, I wasn't really aware of the jam scene at all until I met these guys. And they, they taught me a lot. That and Lock in 2017 taught me yeah. a lot. That was my first music festival was Lock In. Oh, wow. I, I had to Google all the bands. <laughs> Wait, who, who was playing that year? I don't know off the top of my head. Wait, I have the poster right here. We played it. Oh, yeah. Humphreys <laughs> McGee. Humphreys, String Cheese, Phil Lesh and Friends, De- Dead & Co., right? Or no, just Bob Weir. Dude, we've got a fucking great spot on yeah. this poster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> who else is up there? Uh, it's, it's lined up, it's, it's lined up <laughs> uh, by day, and there yeah. was only four bands on Thursday. And so, oh, we're, so we're, we're like on the top row. We're the top, top row. row. It says String <laughs> Cheese Incident, Humphreys McGee, Disco Biscuits, Kendall Street Company. And that's, yeah. that's how it felt. Yeah. <laughs> we were the that first. Was, that, was, that was your moment. That was the first moment. You knew it was possible. That shit was huh? awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. when they had the rotating stage. Yeah. I don't know if they, right. they, well, I don't know if they were going to have another festival, but yeah. How long had you been together at that point? That was 2017. Mm-hmm. We got together 2013, four years. I joined the band in 2016. Right. And bef- before that, you had a separate sax and keyboard players? Yes. Yeah, we had a... The sax player and I um, grew up together in Virginia Beach and went to UVA together and roomed together. Um, and we had started playing together a little bit back before college. Um, but then we started like playing more together and uh, formed the band. Um with Brian and Ryan who are still in the band. And then we picked up Ben, who's probably the most ingrained in the jam scene oh, yeah. prior okay. to, um, you know, he, he was like really into fish. He loves fish. And he was in, he's been in bands like his entire, since he could like walk. Yeah. He's been in bands. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's really cool. Cause like I was into, I was really into Dave and he was really into fish. And so we could kind of get together and like, you know, meld those a bit. And um, I, I used to say, yeah, Ben, uh, 
Ben, sorry, I'm trying to. What do you do? Used I, I, to there's say. a line. There's a line that I that I had. Yeah, like while Ben was learning Van Halen, I was learning Van Morrison, and so so we're a good team, you know. Yeah, you need a little bit way. of both. A little bit of both. Right. So, so I, I, I got the sax and the acoustic guitar guy here. And one of my questions oh, yeah. was unique instrumentation. You have the sax and the acoustic guitar in the same band with the basic electric setup around you trio. How does that inform what you do live in as much as does it restrict you do, or does it allow for explorations that you wouldn't do with a regular five piece, two guitar, keys, drums, bass? I mean, you know, certainly both. Uh, for a long time, I just played sax in the band uh, and didn't play keyboards. And we had two other keyboardists since since I've been in the band. Um, in succession, not at the same time. Yeah, not at the same time. Um, who chose to do other things. And then we didn't have a keyboardist for a while. But it was about the same time I was starting to play with synthesizers more. And so I decided to give it a shot. And that was also when the pandemic hit. So there was a lot of time to practice. A lot of downtime, um, right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of downtime um, and a lot of time to practice piano. And since then, I've just, you know, pushed myself to 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 learn the to instrument. And I felt like we really needed it and I wanted it and I was capable of it. So. It definitely yeah. adds some nice things that you can go back and forth and have both things, you know. I, I love having a saxophone in the band. It's just... It's fantastic, and it's severely underused. I mean, you have, like, Galactic, who does the funk thing with it. You have Dave Matthews, you know, but there isn't a lot unless you want to go jazz. You know, then you'll have yeah. a sax guy kind of thing. So, very nice. Yeah, very I, nice. I love the presence of the sax, and am open to having a keyboard player again, for what it's worth, if you're listening and right. you think you want to play. <laughs> we'll put that out there, though. <laughs> Give I'm serious. I put it out there. Yeah, why not? Uh, hey, you know. Yeah, we are. We're waiting on the right one, though. We we are like, yeah. I mean, keys could be really cool to have live in the touring band. You know, um, it right. definitely adds another element. Um, and for yeah. like the year that Earth stood still, that was the first. I played a little bit of keyboards on the stories, but the year that Earth stood still was the biggest like keyboard project. So I'm playing most of the keys on that record, if if not all of them our producer played a few like synth parts as well. So how it informs our writing and playing live. Like I don't really think about the live performance of it when we're writing the music necessarily. Um, Cause I want the music to sound the way I want it to sound. And then I'll figure out how to recreate it, how I desire. Like, yeah. I'm not worried about the studio restricting me live. Yeah. Especially as a, a keyboardist and a sax. Like sometimes you're going to want those at the same time, you know? Yeah. You have definitely, to be willing to let definitely. that happen. Let's touch on the stories we write for ourselves for a minute, because like I was saying earlier, it is such a different thing. And also how you guys feel your progression as a songwriter has gone since your first albums or the first stuff you wrote. If you want to talk a little bit about your process, things like that. Yeah. Well, the stories um, for me kind of felt like the first like real songwriter album since uh, space for days or or maybe our, our first full-length record earth turns um, and there's a reference to that earth turns record on the stories there's a song called the earth turns um, which is a reference to that to to the first album and i wrote a number of the songs on the stories um, and jake wrote one and ben ben wrote a couple and so yeah it was kind of our our, our first stab at, at the songwriter record um since the since, since the beginning and that felt really good that was in, that was in an you know important time for that to happen for me because i had all these songs that i wanted to put out and the band was the sound of the band was kind of veering you know a little jam heavy or whatever and so it i mean i think it's amazing and, and amazingly versatile um that we're able to to put out a songwriter record, you know, in the vein of like Wilco or something like that. I, I love have. it. I think it's sorely yeah. needed in a lot of jam bands. I'll say it. Um, I think a lot of the lyrics suck for a lot of what goes on out oh. there in jam band, even some of like Trey's new stuff. I cringe at, but I really enjoyed what you guys were coming up with. I just think it's so much harder to write a quote unquote meaningful song than it is to something that's just fun and goofy 
you know, aside from the yeah, technical, yeah. I guess we're just talking about the lyric, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely I've, I've, you know, as a songwriter, I feel like I've developed a ton since, since the beginning and, you know, since I started songwriting and I've honed in on more of like what story I'm trying to tell rather than having a kind of a vague idea of what it is. But then I still draw inspiration from some of the old stuff that I wrote. And, you know, there's a sense of uh, innocence, you know, in those songs and those songwriting uh, that, that makes it really special, I feel. Sometimes the old stuff, when you break it back out, you're like, it, it does have a new light or where you are in your life at that point makes it relevant, you know? So yeah, I, it's it's really interesting. And it's really interesting what other people will think like, oh, that's amazing. And I go, oh, that's, you know, mediocre at best, <laughs> you know? So, um you can you can never t I always say uh, I have a degree in poetry um and I always say that when you write a poem and you give it out to the world it's like you're putting your baby out there to be slaughtered because people are just going to be right. merciless and crush it but you have to just be willing to do yeah. it and hopefully the baby will come back to you and it's stronger for it maybe the stories we write for ourselves was the first song that I wrote that got recorded and released which was Dear White Old Moon which I sing on the record nice so that was fun for me what was that was I, it was it nerve wracking singing on a record the first time? It was pretty nerve wracking. Um, in general, recording can be nerve wracking. Um, I'm sure I got to get up, this right. I got to get this right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a limited amount of time and a limited amount of willpower and you have to get what you need. Um, so it can be, it can be a little anxious, but, but singing, it, it felt natural and fine. I had practiced it for a while and I was like ready. And the producer, I also trusted to make it sound good. Scott Gordon is his name. And nice. he he also mixed the Earth Turns and he mixed the Untitled California Project. So and he's your guy now, basically. Who else, what do he mixed one other thing too, right? Um, he did the California. Did you say California? Yeah, I thought he did. He did Space for Days, Earth Turns. Oh, Space for Days too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, to, to answer your question with a very long answer, I was chill. Okay. I was chill. I, was chill. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So what do you guys listen to when you're not listening to your own stuff? What do you put on to relax? It's different all the time. Um, I go through different phases, you know, let's see. Wood Brothers are my new favorite band. I mean, I've, I've known them for a long time, but I haven't like distinguished them as my favorite band until recently and it's weird because i don't really have favorites of anything like you can't i don't i won't give you i can't give you an answer if you ask what my favorite movie is or my favorite food um but yeah favorite band wood brothers i think they're fucking great i've really been into big thief recently oh yeah so that's what's been getting me shaky graves this band called woody pines tedeschi trucks Talk about putting out albums. Tedeschi Trucks with the four LP set this year. That's yeah. pretty crazy. That's <laughs> yeah. And I, apparently um, they've been doing the whole album, one whole album each night at their Beacon Run. Like the first night they played wow. the first album all the way through. That's pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, that is. Pretty Have you guys that. played yours three yet? The whole space opera in one sitting? Ah. We did it. We played the well, space opera. We did an Inerta in uh, oh, yeah. in, uh Louisa or um, Gooch Gooch no Licking Hole yeah Licking Hole Creek yeah, yeah. in Goochland. There's a brewery called Licking Hole Creek in Goochland. <laughs> we got licked at the at the creek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Louis and I, was, but we were able to play it live. It's hard because it it uses um, a couple different instruments that aren't our normal fare. So the Barry Sax is on that record. The Ewe is on that record. Isn't there a banjo maybe? Uh, there's a banjo on, the, uh, on the stories. stories. Yeah. Oh, we have stories. played okay. stories live. We have stories live on Spotify. We played it. Yeah. We did that. Um, that was cool. In the beginning or in 2020, in 2020. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think so. Must have been. Yeah. So, so you guys, you put out, um, you had your, couple albums three albums in three years are you working on a new one or are you gonna rest on your laurels for a little bit we've got one in the bag ready to release um exciting yay what's it uh, called it's called separation 95 is the name of the album all one word um 
and I'm sure we can share it with you, perhaps. Uh, and it it's eight songs. It's uh, a good like 38 minutes long, kind of like inspired by Dark Side of the Moon length. Um, I don't want to tell too much, but it has a Grateful Dead cover on it. No, oh, nice, fun. interesting. Mm, you know, I have um, to think on that. About it. Nice. And when is yeah, this coming out? Think about what, what it might be. It's what a it pretty, be? it's a pretty fucked up Grateful Dead cover. <laughs> It's, which is and it's awesome. Um, I mean, but, immediately, I, I, I get their early stuff immediately, but like born cross-eyed or something is where my head goes when I think about you guys doing it for some reason. Well, yeah, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. We'll at least be able to share that one with you. That'll be the first single. Will be will nice. be that cover. And when does this so, come out? We're not at liberty to say yet. Yeah, uh, so. <laughs> Uh, Mostly when because does... we literally don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we, are, we, we are we're shopping it around to labels, so yeah, we're kind of seeing where that lands. Nice. Yeah, we um, recently finished the mastering process, and it and we finished the art, and it feels great. So very nice. Yeah. And are you guys on the road now? Or are you chilling at home? Or we'll chill, we're chilling at home for this week, and then come come Saturday, we will be on the road for thirty three days straight. So wow. this is our last week at home for a while. Nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. you guys be safe out there on the road. Um, I yeah. think we're gonna yeah. gonna wrap this up with you guys. Uh, Amanda wasn't here. We might have gone longer, but I think we covered a lot of good stuff. Are you guys happy? I was gonna say JJ Kale. That's another another songwriter and music i've been listening to recently oh really love that um, what, what's that yeah. album really the one really he has with uh i don't know really i love um troubadour and i love naturally naturally yes naturally yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, have you ever have you ever heard of a guy named jesse winchester kind of no. reminds me of jj kale he was uh he didn't want to go in the Vietnam War and move to Canada, which basically killed his career. But I'll uh, look him up, Jesse Winchester, some really good songs. Cool. Will do. Very nice. And thank you guys so much. When do you think you're going to come through Baltimore? Well, the Ramble Fest is the, is the closest one, and that's when we play on Friday. That's, that's in, on Friday. Technically in All Darlington, right. Maryland. Maryland. Yeah. All right, cool. I'll have to look that up. I'm uh, I'm going to see Bobby Saturday night, so I don't know if I can get someone for the kids two nights, but I'm going to try to come down there and check it out. Right on. Yeah, Nothing we'll is too far in Maryland. Huh? Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll be doing our own set, and we're also playing a uh, super jam set with the Dirty Grass players. Oh, neat. If you know them. And you're going to yeah. be recording this? Yeah, as long as oh. everything works. As long as everything works. <laughs> Very nice. Well, thank you guys so much for, for taking some time. And um, we're going to post some information about you. I'm going to probably next week at the end of the uh, next Monday when our episode comes out, we'll put out part of this. And then I think we'll release the whole thing maybe a couple weeks after that as a standalone episode. But I'll keep you in touch with you guys. And um I'm mostly on Twitter. She's on Instagram. So we should have it covered with okay. finding you guys. And I really appreciate it. It was so great meeting you. Great to meet you too. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having us. I hope your, your kid heals up. Yeah. 